Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, where we take up important articles of the day from the newspaper and discuss them in detail as per the demands of civil services exam. Articles covered today are displayed on your screen and their notes in PDF and Word format are provided in the description box down below. Without further ado, let us begin. Now let us start our today's discussion by the first article of the day and it appeared in page 1, 8 and 15 of the Indian Express newspaper. Now the union government on Monday, it approved the proposal to introduce the Women Reservation Bill in the parliament. Now this topic is important from both GS Paper 1 and GS Paper 2 perspective. As the syllabus, it highlights the role of women in Indian society in GS Paper 1, whereas on the other hand, in GS Paper 2, the syllabus highlights parliament and state legislature, its structure and its functioning. An introduction of Women Reservation Bill will significantly alter the structure of Indian parliament and will also in a positive way affect the functioning of these houses. Further, this topic is also important from Maine's perspective, which is apparent from this PYQ of the year 2019 on reservation of seats for women in the institution of local self-government. Hence, in the scope of our today's discussion on Women Reservation Bill, we will first cover why is there a need to bring such Women Reservation Bill in the Indian Parliament. Further, we will also discuss arguments both in support and arguments which are against introduction of women-based reservation. Further, we will also discuss the alternatives that exist and these alternatives, they will be followed by a suggestive way forward so as to what precursors are needed before introducing this women reservation in Indian parliament. Hence, let us start our today's discussion by discussing why is there a need for women reservation bill. Now, why is there a need to bring reservation for women in legislature? Now, India ranks in the bottom quarter among UN member nations in terms of proportion of elected women representatives in the parliament. Now, there are 78 women MPs in 17th Lok Sabha, which comes at around 14% of total strength. Now, it is to be noted that the percentage of women MPs have increased over the years. However, it is still low when you compare this number with representation in other countries. For example, Bangladesh, it sees around 20% of women legislators. Whereas, Nepal, it has 30% of women who are members of their parliament. Hence, there is a need to increase women participation in Indian parliament. Further, the Global Gender Gap Report of the year 2021, it highlighted that there has been a decline in number of women ministers in India which was 23.1% in the year of 2019 and it has decreased to 9.1% in the year of 2021. And this number is also way short of international average, which comes at around 22% of women ministers. Now, development in India, it has been severely hampered by the breadth of gender gap and limited female participation which is in traditionally male-dominating institutions. Hence, increasing the participation of women in parliament can be a way forward. Also, the constitution of India, it provides for several provisions for women's political empowerment. For example, Article 15 subsection 3, it empowers the state to make special provisions which can be legislative or otherwise in order to secure women's socio-political advancement. Further, Article 325 of the Constitution, it guarantees equal rights for both sexes and entitles the women to enjoy economic, social, cultural and political rights which will be on equal footing with men. Further, India has acceded to several international agreements as well, which supports proactive state measures for women's political development. The Convention on Elimination on All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also known as CEDAW, it was ratified by India in the year of 1993 
and this convention it provides appropriate measures which includes legislation in order to ensure the full advancement of women and to eliminate discrimination among women in political and public life further the beijing platform for action of their 1995 it endorses affirmative action for women in political spheres in order to achieve democratic transformation women empowerment and achieving the goals of sustainable development now that we have identified the need for women reservation in legislature let us discuss the arguments both in support and against such a legislation now there are few arguments that supports bringing of women reservation in legislatures the first argument is that reservation for women is essential for achieving political participation of women and such a measure will help women fight abuse discrimination and inequality also women reservation is critical for sustainable progress against human development indicators the second need is that women reservation ensures political participation of women in society which is essential for building a functioning and representative democracy further women political participation can provide inspiration for women and it will enable them to take action for a better and more equal society and it will help them make meaningful contribution towards our inclusive national developmental goals additionally women reservation is intrinsic to eliminate gender discrimination and strengthening the women's empowerment as enshrined by fundamental right to equality and freedom which is provided in the preamble and constitution of india further reservation for women in panchayats has resulted into an encouraging experience now gram panchayats with elected women leaders they have invested more in public goods and have become closely linked to women's concern and this has resulted into subsequent increase in percentage of female local leaders who contest and win elections improvement in human developmental indicators making democracy more representative proving to be an inspiration for other women strengthening women's empowerment and an encouraging experience in panchayats all arguments they support women reservation in legislatures however there are few arguments that are against women reservation in legislatures let us find out these arguments in the next slide now the first argument that is against bringing women reservation in india is that it will further the unequal status of women as then women will not be perceived to be competing on merit and hence it will perpetuate their unequal status in the society further reservation for women will help women who come from elite circles and it will help them gain political power which will further aggravate the plight of poor and deprived women in the society also bringing women reservation in legislature would mean that there would be a rotation of reserved constituencies and this rotation may reduce the incentive for current mps to work in his constituency as these male mps they might be ineligible to seek reelection from that constituency itself further women reservation will perpetuate the proxy culture for example there is a concept called sarpanch pati which is when a woman who is elected on the seat does not have the real power and a male decision maker acts on her behalf a similar situation can also be problematic for women mps who might get elected from reserved constituencies further provisions for women reservation will divert attention from larger issues in the political sphere such as criminalization of politics and inner party democracy also reservation for women in legislature would mean that deserving candidates who might be male they may eventually be not allowed to contest elections from their preferable constituencies now that we have discussed arguments both in support and against women reservation let us discuss few alternatives that might be taken in order to increase women participation in legislatures an alternative to women's reservation is the idea of ensuring reservation within political parties as countries 
such as Canada, United Kingdom, France and Sweden, they reserve seats for women within political parties, but they do not have quotas for women in their parliament. Further, the Election Commission of India, it has suggested a candidate quotas for women which will be at party level and it will require only an ordinary amendment to the Representation of People Act of 1951. Further, there is another alternative, which is by introducing dual member constituencies, which means that constituencies, instead of reserving seats for women, will nominate two members, among which one can be women. However, lack of rigorous evidence on the efficacy of these alternatives has limited the scope for adoption of these practices worldwide. Hence, women reservation in legislature is seen as a viable alternative. Further, it requires both political commitment and rigorous evidence, which will be necessary to deliberate and debate on such a legislation. And it will ensure that the passage in parliament of such a bill will bridge critical gender gaps in both political and legislative decision making. Further, strategies are required in order to bring change in the male-dominated value system in the society in addition to organizing awareness and leadership development programs for women which will be essential to boost their confidence and hence these policies must be implemented in addition to women reservation for increasing the women's participation in Indian politics. Hence, there is a need for enhanced political commitment bringing change in male-dominated value system and bringing an awareness and leadership developmental programs for women participants is essential to increase the women's participation in politics in addition to provisions of women reservation. This will ensure that the Indian democracy becomes much more representative of its demography. This was all for today's discussion on women reservation. Now moving on to the next article of the day which appeared in page 12 of the Indian Express. Now this article, it explains how the Digital India program, it has enabled focus on building digital public infrastructure. And this has resulted into massive increase in digital transactions all across Indian economy. Now this digital public infrastructure, it is important from GS paper 3 perspective. As the syllabus, it highlights infrastructure. Further, in the mains of the year 2023, a question appeared on status of digitalization in the Indian economy. Further, various government initiatives to promote digitization such as DigiLocker, it appeared in prelims of the year 2016. Hence, this topic is important both from prelims as well as mains perspective. Now in the scope of our today's discussion, we will first take a look at what is PM Vani Scheme, which is a short form for Prime Minister's Wi-Fi Access Network Interface. And this interface is an example of digital public infrastructure. Hence, we will also go into detail as to what consists of digital public infrastructure as well as its benefits to Indian economy in general. Hence, let us start our today's discussion by discussing what is a PM Vani scheme. Now this PM Vani framework, it aims to proliferate broadband access by providing public Wi-Fi networks and it has a focus on creating robust digital communication infrastructure in the country. Now one of the primary objectives of PM Vani scheme is to simplify the process of providing public Wi-Fi services. And this is taken through following features. The first feature in the PM Vani initiative is the establishment of public data offices. As these public data offices, they will provide for last mile public Wi-Fi providers. And these providers will not be required to have license or register and they are also not obligated to pay any fees to the Department of Telecom. Hence, this initiative, it removes bureaucratic hurdles and encourages local shops and small establishment to become Wi-Fi providers. 
A similar example was that of PCOs that provided for telecommunication services at affordable costs. The second feature of PM Vani scheme is that there will be public data office aggregators and these entities they will aggregate last mile providers such as public data offices and these aggregators they only need to register however they will not be charged any fees for this registration hence this process it streamlines the registration which is completed within 7 to 10 working days further this pm vani scheme it also envisages app providers as this framework it encourages the participation of such app providers who will offer services such as registering the users as well as providing authentication to such users. Hence, we can say that these app providers, they will facilitate users access to a public Wi-Fi hotspot and it will also help enhance the overall user experience. Further, this scheme also provides for a central registry and this central registry will maintain details of app providers, public data office aggregators as well as public data offices. And this registry will be maintained by the Center for Development of Telematics also known as CDOT. Now what are the benefits of PM Vani scheme? As this scheme, it aims to provide ubiquitous digital connectivity across the country. Hence, by creating a network of interoperable public digital offices, this scheme aims to provide last mile distribution of broadband network which will be done at an affordable prices. Hence, it will make internet access accessible even to the remotest area of the country. As this scheme, it provides Wi-Fi packages for as low as 5 to 10 Indian rupees. Hence, it makes Wi-Fi affordable even for the low income households and rural communities. This will further help to bridge the digital divide that currently exists in the country. Also important is that this scheme, it provides for an open and scalable framework. For example, like the success of UPI initiative in the finance sector, PM Vani, it provides for an open and scalable framework for internet distribution. And this encourages participation of various entities such as public data offices, public data office aggregators and app providers into a dynamic ecosystem. Further, this scheme also provides business opportunities for local entrepreneurs. As this framework, it allows for unbundling the internet distribution at the last mile and this opens business opportunities for aggregators, enabling them to play a crucial role in delivering affordable internet access. Further, this scheme also nurtures the growth of local entrepreneurs as these local entrepreneurs, they can set up public data offices in their small shops, local establishments or even in their households. And this, it empowers these entrepreneurs to augment their monthly earnings while promoting internet usage in the local community. Further, this scheme also utilizes the existing infrastructure as it aims to make better use of existing infrastructure such as Bharat Net Network and it encourages the internet service provider and telecom companies to expand their reach to underserved areas by turning their end consumers as internet retailers or service providers. Last but not the least, this scheme also provides for digital empowerment of Indian population as it contributes to digital empowerment of citizens by providing them with affordable and accessible internet usage. And this empowers the individual with knowledge and opportunities that this digital world offers. Now this PM Vani initiative is one of few examples that the government has taken in order to further the digital public infrastructure in the country. Now what is this digital public infrastructure? Let us discuss this in the next slide. Now these digital public infrastructure, 
they are solutions and systems that enables the provision of essential society wide functions and services for both public as well as private sector and these infrastructure they include many forms for example digital form of identification verification civil registration payment systems data exchanges and information system now this digital public infrastructure in the country it was first introduced in the year of 2009 with the launch of aadhar scheme now let us take a look at various form of digital public infrastructure in the country the first and the most foundational aspect of digital public infrastructure is called as jam initiative which includes jandhan accounts aadhar system as well as mobile and this system it furthers the financial inclusion in the country because the population covered with bank accounts in the country has increased substantially it was 53% in the year of 2015 and 16 and it increased to 78% in the year of 2019 and 2021 hence we can say that this jam initiative has furthered the financial inclusion in the country the second important example of a digital public infrastructure is the provision of digital public goods such as digital verification also known as ekyc digital repository in form of digi locker digital payment system which is under unified payment interface e-commerce system which is heralded by ondc and an account aggregator framework and these digital public goods they intend to serve many outcomes first of all is that these digital public goods they provide greater financial inclusion by increasing the access of formal credit further these digital public goods they also incentivize higher consumption and investment which will lead to economic growth further these digital public goods for example ondc they open avenues for greater e-commerce market access further they also increase credit availability for small businesses and all these factors they combined into strengthened economic growth in longer term further Digital finance architecture is also an example of digital public infrastructure. For example, the digitalized GST system is heralded by GST network as well as e-way bill system. Further, there are other digital identity initiatives such as Aadhar system, e-shram portal, Swanidhi portal as well as Udayam portal. and outcomes of these digital finance infrastructure they include greater formalization of both businesses as well as indian workforce and this further leads to greater formalization of the indian economy now digital identities they have included informal groups into formal economic net for example street vendors they have been encouraged to use swanidhi portal as well as msmes they use udayam portal on the other hand unorganized workers they can enroll into e shram platform and this digital identity initiatives they have simplified the access and enabled the access for formal credit to these marginalized groups and as a result more than 32.7 lakh street vendors they have availed the first loan of rupees 10000 under the pm swanidhi scheme hence we can say that this digital finance architecture it has increased the formalization of transaction in the indian economy last but not the least is the unified digital interfaces that provide for simplified governance in the country for example there is a national single window system for business approvals further there is also a jan samarth portal which provides for credit linked government scheme also there is an app called umang app which provides access to both central and state government services while on the other hand pm gati shakti initiative it provides a platform which brings together multiple ministries hence we can say 
that these unified digital interfaces they enhance the ease of doing business in the country by integration of existing system into a single portal further they also help in reducing the logistical costs that are incurred in moving of different goods and this is because these initiatives they provide an integrated planning and coordinated implementation of multimodal projects in the country for example these projects they are undertaken through pm gati shakti initiatives hence overall we can say that this digital public infrastructure it increases access to credit leads to higher consumption and investment and increases access to e-commerce market while on the other hand it also leads to formalization of businesses and workforce which leads to informal groups coming into formal economic net while on the other hand they also enhance ease of doing business in the country while reducing the logistical cost in the indian economy hence these all put together they lead to higher economic growth in the longer term hence this was all for today's discussion on digital public infrastructure now let us move to the next article of the day and it appeared in page 9 of the indian express newspaper now the issue of caste it has been at the forefront of indian politics and in this regard various parties they have been demanding for a caste based enumeration of india's population and this is due to an intention to further enhance the scope of caste based affirmative action policies in favor of other backward classes in the indian society hence caste based census it is the topic of our today's discussion as this topic is important from gs paper 1 perspective as the syllabus it highlights salient features of indian society whereas gs paper 2 syllabus it highlights mechanisms laws institution and bodies constituted for protection of betterment of vulnerable section and in this regard other backward classes they form vulnerable section in the indian society further this topic is also important from mains perspective as you can see from this pyq of the year 2020 on has caste has it lost its relevance in understanding of multicultural indian society further affirmative action policies especially under the article 16 it was asked in the prelims of the year 2023 hence this topic it is also important from prelims as well as mains perspective hence in the scope of our today's discussion on caste based census we will first cover what is a caste based census and will also identify reasons for why it was stopped in the first place then we will also discuss the need for caste based census in the country which will be followed by a way forward as it will suggest inclusive as well as holistic measures that needs to be undertaken for caste based census exercise hence let us start our today's discussion by discussing what is a caste based census now what is a caste based survey caste census or survey it is a caste wise tabulation of population which can be conducted in a census exercise now enumeration of caste was last included in the census of india dating back to the year of 1931 this practice it was stopped by the british in the 1941 census and post independence the government of india it did not revive such practices However subsequent census in post independent india it publishes a separate data on scheduled caste and scheduled tribes however such census data does not include other castes now let us discuss why such enumeration of caste based census was stopped in the first place it was stopped because estimates on caste data are already available with the government of india as reasonable estimates of broad social breakup of indian population it is already available through various government surveys now such data is available with the government through conduction of national sample survey office data or national family health survey data hence the need for caste based estimates were not felt 
Further, there are operational difficulties in conduction of such surveys as well. As a full caste-based census, it will include a jati-wise breakup which would pose extreme difficulties. As currently, we do not have any official list of all castes in the country. And this would mean that an extensive post-census classification work will cause further delay in publication of census exercise. And this will create difficulties for all other activities that are associated with census exercise. Further, conduction of caste-based survey can promote identity politics, which may further lead to marginalization of developmental issues such as health or education. Further, conduction of such surveys may lead to rise in demand for higher quotas and it will further pose a threat to the judicial imposed cap of 50% on reservations. Hence, such surveys were stopped in the first place. Now, due to demands of various sections of the society, some state governments have decided to conduct caste-based survey. For example, Bihar. Now, why is there a need for such caste-based survey? Let us discuss this in the next slide. Now, arguments which support the need for caste-based surveys include that the current data on castes, which are collected by NSSO and National Family Health Survey data, are based on survey-based estimates, which is unlike the census data. Because the census is actually the enumeration of every person in the country, and it is not based on estimates. Further, census also generates data on educational level, occupation, household assets, and life expectancy of each group, and it enumerates at each level that is recognized by the government of India. Further, there are common practices that some census data are released with a gap of 5 to 7 years after the census is completed. Hence, an enumeration of caste-based survey can be published even after the census data is generally published. Further, caste-based census is also important because it is necessary to understand people's socio-economic status, which are determined by caste and their subcaste. And such data, it will help in designing policies for affirmative action and redistributive justice. Further, the Supreme Court in Indra Sahni judgment, it highlighted that caste-based evidence, it needs to be collected every 10 years or so in order to screen out the privileged caste from the benefits of reservation. And a caste-based survey is a need of the hour for evidence-based policy making. Further, over the last decade, we have witnessed some of the largest mobilizations which are based on caste and it was done by the dominant sections of society such as Jats, Patels and Marathas and they demanded reservations. However, these demands were not based on scientific evidences on the size or their relative level of deprivation. Hence, a caste-based survey will provide us with the data which will eventually help the government to evaluate such demands based on scientific data. And it will help the vulnerable section to legitimize their demands for reservation policies. Now that we have understood the need for caste-based survey, let us understand a way forward which will further help to utilize existing data to improve the condition of backward classes in the country. The first way forward is to understand the utility of already existing data and it will eventually help in conduct of academic exercise which will help map social inequalities and social changes in the Indian society. Further, there is a need to read all existing data in a holistic manner as linking and syncing of aggregated census data with other large data sets such as NSSO and National Family Health Survey data, it will help cover issues that the census exercise eventually do not. For example, maternal health of marginalized section women. Further, there is a need to undertake changes in the census exercise as it will help employ methods that are precise, faster and cost effective and it will eventually lead 
to better coordination between different data sources. Additionally, there is a need for stock taking of previous exercises as it will help us learn the changes that are necessary in conduction of census exercises. Further, there is a need to address concerns that are associated with census exercise as there is a need to address the issue that are related to methodology, relevance of census exercise, dissemination of census data, transparency mechanism and ensuring the privacy of such data, it needs to be taken seriously in order to make the exercise of census more effective. Hence, by utilizing the existing data on casts, reading all the different data sets holistically, inculcating changes in census exercise, stock taking the previous exercise and addressing the concerns that are related to methodology, transparency and privacy will enable the caste-based census to facilitate an effective policy work and it will further help academy in order to map social inequalities and social changes with respect to Indian society. Hence, this was all for today's discussion on caste-based survey. Now moving on to the next article of the day which appeared in page 9 of the Indian Express newspaper. Now the Karnatakas Hoysala Temple Complex, they have been added to the UNESCO's World Heritage List and this was added during the 45th session of World Heritage Committee which is going on currently in the city of Riyadh under the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now these Hoysala temples, they mark India's 42nd UNESCO World Heritage Sites. An archaeological survey of India, it has revealed that India has submitted the nomination for these temples in the January of the year 2022. And this site, it was under the UNESCO's tentative list since 2014. Now these Hoysala temple complex, they were constructed during the 12th and 13th century by Hoysala kings and they are dedicated to Lord Vishnu as well as Lord Shiva. Now this topic is important from GS Paper 1 perspective which highlights Indian culture and it will cover salient aspects of architecture from ancient to modern times. Further, temple architecture has also been asked in the mains of the year 2013 where a question appeared on Chola temple architecture. Further, temples that have been in use recently, they are also important from prelims perspective, which is very much apparent from this PYQ of the year 2022 on Chosat Yogini temple near Morena. Hence, in the scope of our today's discussion, we will first cover three Hoysala temples that have been added to World Heritage List. Further, we will also discuss details about Hoysala architecture. Hence, let us start our today's discussion by discussing which of the following Hoysala temples were added to World Heritage List. Now these Hoysala temples, they were constructed between 12th and 13th century. The first among which is the Chanakeshwa temple which is located in Belur of Hassan district in Karnataka. Now this temple complex, it is situated along the banks of Yagachi river. And this remarkable complex, it is ingeniously designed with a rectangular layout. As this layout, it facilitates traditional ritual circumambulation of the deity, which offers devotees with an immersive religious experience. Now the construction of this particular temple, it commenced in 1117 AD. And this temple is dedicated to Lord Vishnu. And it serves as a sacred haven for devotees seeking solace and spiritual connection with Lord Vishnu. Now one of the most captivating feature of Chanakeshwa temple is its richly sculptured exterior. As these exterior, it consists of intricate carvings which narrate compelling stories from the lives of Lord Vishnu, his divine incarnations and epic narratives of Ramayana as well as Mahabharata. One of the most interesting features is that among these depictions, 
there also exists representation of Lord Shiva and it showcases harmonious coexistence of deities within the Hindu pantheon. Now this Janakeshwar temple, it has been a center of uninterrupted worship and it continues to thrive as a vibrant hub of devotion and it remains a pilgrimage site of Vaishnavite devotees. Now the second important temple is that of Hoysalaswara temple which is located in Halebid of Hassan district. Now this place of Halebid, it emerged as a capital of Hoysala empire. And this temple, it was constructed in the year of 1121 AD. And it was during the reign of King Vishnuvardhana Hoysala Swera. And this temple, it stands as a testament of the artistic prowess and devotion of Hoysala dynasty. Now this Hoysala Swara temple is dedicated to Lord Shiva. Now what sets this Hoysala Swara temple apart from the others is that there are more than 240 wall sculptures that adorn its outer walls. And these intricate carvings, they also narrate captivating stories from Hindu mythology as well as historical events. Now additionally, this Halibid, it extends its cultural heritage beyond this Hoysala Swara temple as well. As within the walled complex, you can also discover three Jain temples dating back to this Hoysala period. As these temples, they serve as a testament of religious diversity and harmonious coexistence of different faiths that existed in that region. Additionally, there is also a stepped well which adds to the historical significance of this site and it also reflects engineering achievements of that particular time. Now the third temple is that of Keswa temple which is located in Somnathpur of Mysore district. Now this Keswa temple is a veritable masterpiece which boasts of a mesmerizing Trikuta architecture and this temple it is dedicated to Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna he exists in three distinct forms in this temple that is Janardana, Keshava as well as Venugopala and this trifecta of deities they embody various facades of the divine and they provide a multifaceted spiritual experience for devotees. Now after we have taken a look at three temples which were included in world heritage list let us take a comprehensive overview of Hoysala architecture. Now this Hoysala empire, it was a prominent Kannadinga dynasty and it held dominion over a significant part of present day Karnataka and they existed during the span of 10th to 14th centuries. Now let us understand the evolution of Hoysala architecture from its inception to flourishing style. Now this type of architecture, it primarily subscribed to the Vesara style of temple architecture. And in the period of Hoysala dynasty, this architecture, it reached its zenith as an independent and distinct style. Now there are many features of this Hoysala architecture. The first is that Hoysala rulers, they were renowned for their prolific temple construction. Hence, their architectural style it is often described as a temple-centric architecture. Further, the temples of this particular architecture, they subscribe to a star-shaped ground plans. Now, unlike the crucified ground plan, which was known as Panchayatan style, the shrines in Hoysala architecture, they subscribe to an intricately designed stellate plan, which is also another name of star-like plan system. As you can see from this diagram, the central pillared hall, it consists of principal shrines. Whereas other subsidiary shrines, they are located on the ends of various star-like structures. Now this star-shaped ground plan, it is employed in many temples of Hoysala architecture. And these temples, they are erected over a raised platform which is called as a Jagati. And this raised platform, it stood at approximately 1 meter of its height. 
Now these temple, they also exhibit a symmetrical arrangement of multiple shrines. And the walls and staircases of these temples, they follow a zigzag pattern. Further, Hoysalas, they also favored use of soapstone as a primary building material, which are also known as chloride schists. And these soapstones, they allowed for carvings and intricate detailing. And it further enabled the creation of elaborate sculptures and motifs that adorn these temples. Now these intricate sculptures, they grace nearly every surface of the Hoysala temples and thereby they depict scenes from Hindu mythology, celestial beings, deities, animals and intricate geometric patterns. Now massive emphasis was laid on decoration of temples and both exterior as well as interior parts of the temple, they adorned these intricate carvings. Now, after we have discussed features of Hosala style architecture, let us also discuss the distinctive elements of this particular style. The first distinctive element is that these temples, they consisted of what is called a mantapa. As these temples, they incorporated both open mantapa as well as closed mantapa and these mantapas, they consisted of highly ornate ceilings which bed mythological figures as well as floral designs. Further, these temples, they also consisted of circular pillars which were located in the mantapas of these temples. And each of these pillars, they featured four brackets at the top which were adorned by sculptural figures. Further, these temples also consisted of vimanas. And these vimanas, they were plain on the inside but they were profusely elaborated on the outside. Further, this temple also consisted of a feature which was called as Makar Torana. And these Makar Torana, they led to the mantapas of the temple. And these Makar Toranas, they were adorned with sculptured image in its forehead. Further, these Makar Toranas, these also consisted Shalabhanjikas as these were mythical female figures which are found in four brackets on top of every pillars and also on each side of Makar Toranas. Further, these temples, they also consisted of shrines which were classified based on number of shrines. For example, a Ekakuta temple consisted of one shrine Whereas a Dvekuta temple, it consisted of two shrines. Further, there was also another feature, which is known as Kirti Mukh. And these Kirti Mukh, they often embellish the Vimanas of certain Hoysala temples. Further, these Hoysala temples, they also consisted of mythical elements. As this art, it excelled in presenting Hindu mythology through sculpted and architectural forms. For example, these temples, they consisted of scenes from Ramayana, Mahabharata, Puranas, which were intricately adorned on these temple walls. Hence, in the summary, this Hoysala architecture, it represents a captivating chapter in the history of Indian art and architecture. And its evolution, right from its nascent stage, to its mature and distinctive style that emerged under the Hoysara rule, it showcases a profound commitment to a temple-centric design, intricate carvings and a star-shaped ground plans. Hence, this was all for today's discussion on Hoysala architecture. Now moving on to the next article of the day which appeared in page 17 of the Indian Express. Now in this article, the insurance regulator, that is IRDI, it has formed a steering committee. And this steering committee, it will act as an apex decision-making body for creation of Bhima Sugam platform. Now, this topic of Bhima Sugam platform is important from GS Paper 3 perspective. As the syllabus, it highlights inclusive growth and issues arising out of it. And a Bhima Sugam-like platform will further the inclusive growth in the country by providing insurance schemes to a wider section of population. 
further this topic is also important from prelims point of view as the topic of insurance and social security coverage was asked in the prelims of the year 2012 hence in the scope of our today's discussion we will take a look at what is a bima trinity now bima sugam platform is a part of bima trinity further this trinity also includes bima vistar as well as bima vahaks hence in the scope of our today's discussion we will take a look at what comprises of bima trinity now the first component of this trinity is bima sugam platform as this platform it seeks to integrate insurers and distributors into one single platform and this platform it will enable easy access under a single roof for insurance companies agents brokers banks and even aggregators and this platform it will enable individuals to buy life health motor as well as property insurance policies in an online mode further this platform will also act as a centralized database which will assist consumers with all of their insurance related queries further this platform it also acts as a one stop shop for consumers who at a later stage they can further pursue service requests and settlement of their claims through a single portal now the second aspect of this bima trinity is the bima vistar which provides a bundled risk cover for life health property as well as accident related insurances and this vistar yojana it will have defined benefits for each risk that can be paid out faster than usual without the need for insurance surveyors also important in this regard is the bima vahaks as these vahaks they act as carriers of insurance products this vahak yojana it envisages a women centric workforce in each of gram sabhas who will then meet women heads of each households and these vahaks they will convince these women about benefits of composite insurance products hence we can say that bima sugam bima vistar and bima vahaks they are envisaged to increase the insurance penetration as well as insurance density of indian population hence it will further the inclusive growth of indian economy hence this was all for today's discussion on bima trinity and it also concludes our today's discussion of daily news simplified